Uh, so our next uh, uh, presentation is uh, about a topic that I'm very, uh, I, I feel is fundamentally important to the infrastructure of our industry. Uh, you know, uh, years ago we, we figured out how to tie things together with DOIs. Uh, now we're uh, able to recognize authors of uh, the The great frontier ahead of us uh, is how to do the same for institutions. Many of you uh, talk to us about being able to tie things together uh, across disparate systems. Uh, for example, being able to recognize uh, that authors who are writing papers are the same as the institutions uh, that are subscribing. Uh, uh, to your journals. Uh, and I don't think that really, we could all try at ways of doing this, but it's not going to work uh, until we have a decent standard. Uh, uh, that's the Crosstrack is working on this, and we really looking forward to hearing the progress. Thanks. All right. Um, so, uh, hello, I'm Jennifer Kaplan. I'm the Director of Research and Development at So I brought my laptop up here in case I can talk in my notes. Uh, just, just because it, it's really, it's starting to catch up with me a bit. By Jan, it's not you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm going to start with a story about scholarly infrastructure. This is kind of an origin story of the organizational identifier, which hasn't been created yet. Usually you'd have an origin story for something that's really exciting and established, but I'm just assuming that's going to happen. So, um, so scholarly in infrastructure, um, as, you all, as we all know, there's an immense amount of metadata out there that we all have to deal with. Um, work that used to be done by people needs to be done by machines. Um, we need to identify, connect, and analyze a lot of data. And it's uh, currently, a lot of that work is made possible by identifiers. I'm a little biased since I work for Crossref, but I, I, I think we can all agree that they're pretty useful. Um, I, I, identifiers, they do more than identify. They locate, they can verify, they make, you can make connections through things with uh, persistent identifiers because it's not a big part of the identi identification part is in the uh, metadata behind it. Um, so we've done all this work. We have uh, Crossref DOIs. We have ORCIDs for um, authors. Uh, what's the next step? Um, have all the problems been solved? No, we still have a, a big problem. Um, and this is, um, these slides are all created by uh, Jeff Builder originally. He's a, he's a very dynamic speaker. So I, I don't know that I'm going to do them justice. I'm going to try, and I apologize if you've seen this before. So the problem is that we have a two-legged stool, which I guess in some sense could be is useful if you have a really good sense of balance. You could sit on a two-legged stool. Uh, you could pop it up against the wall. Um, if it had really big legs, maybe you could make it work. But generally, you know, it, it, it's 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 incomplete. So if you think of one leg being content identifiers, uh, like a data site and Crossref DLIs, the second leg uh, being contributor identifiers, ORCID, what would the third leg be? Organization identifiers. Those are the three pieces we need to identify uh, research outputs, connect the, um, the object, the research objects, and the people and organizations behind that. So you might think, oh, there are a lot of organization identifiers already. There's you know, Disney, Ringgold, um, a, a lot of efforts um, that exist uh, to, to tackle this problem. But I think if you really dig into the data and you look closely at these, um, these efforts, they do solve problems and they do a lot of good things. But the problem we're trying to solve is the need for a community-driven, open way of disambiguating organizations. So we have some organization identifiers, but it, it only gets us part way there. So, and this isn't just a cross-ref thing. Um, I should, as 
I should stress that the organization's identifier plan, I'll get more into this later, it's actually not a Crossref initiative. Crossref isn't creating organization identifiers. We're just very involved because we just love identifiers. <laughs> um, there's a, a big kind of hefty substantial study by uh, just, just in Kazari about um, into the whole identifying organization space. And their basic conclusion was that identifying organizations is a nightmare. Um, so I think there's a consensus among a lot of members of the scholarly communication community that we need a comprehensive, open, and accessible organization identifier infrastructure. So while we do have some organization identifiers in existence, there's still gaps. Um, so some organizations, including Crossref, uh, but also equally Datasite, ORCID, and poor got together and decided, well, let's tackle this. Why these? Why do these organizations come together to do this? Um, there's a definite need for organization and identifiers. All of these organizations really know the identifier space. We've made mistakes. We've had a lot of successes. Um, we have a lot of experience with creating identifiers and maintaining them. Um, we're all from different parts of the community which is very important. And I think probably the most important part is that we're willing to do it. We're willing to step up and say, okay, let's get this done and put resources towards that. Um, and so I mentioned this isn't a Crossref initiative. I, the plan is also not to create an entirely new organization as was done with Orchid. Or um, we don't want to create a brand new independent organization every time someone creates a new identifier. It could get really uh, messy very quickly. Um, I'll get more into that later as well. Um, why is this happening now? Um, everyone seems to be ready for this. Uh, at Crossref, um, I'm the head of metadata and I was also in charge of technical support for a long time and I can tell you that people are always complaining about our affiliation information or our lack of affiliation information. And we don't have a lot of affiliation information because it's really hard for you all to collect that and send it to us. Um, we, we know what's required. We know the work that needs to go into uh, creating identifiers. And we all have a, a lot of energy, myself excluded at the moment. <laughs> um, and, and we're very committed to doing so. There's been a lot of uh, conversations over over years, and it's been decided that now is the time. So there has been quite a lot of work done so far. I want to go through that quickly. Um, the first step with anything is to do some research. So um, the the organizations involved in this went through and gathered uh, existing information research on um, the need for organization identifiers. Uh, we assembled some use cases. Uh, we went to a lot of uh, conferences. Um, I think there was a very substantial discussion at first 11 in 2016. I don't know if anyone was there. I wasn't, but I heard it was great. So <laughs> um, we talked with a lot of the other, other people in, in the same space. And of course, we consulted with our the Crossref membership and data site consulted with their members and were in contact with their community as well. Um, and what came out of that were some organizational and technical requirements to get this off. Um, the organizational requirements, one of the big focuses of the organization uh, building is trust. Uh, this organization really needs to be trusted by the community. So that means it needs to be community driven and transparent and open. It also needs to be uh, a bit decentralized, that's why we don't want to have one organization. Um, I think one of the, the fears is that you'll, you'll create an organization, identifier organization, will get too big for its britches and go off and do things that it wasn't intended to do. We really need it to be a, a collaborative effort from all of us that remains open. Um, one of the um, really the things that really guided the um, the group was looking at the ORCID principles. Um, when ORCID was originally conceived, they came up with some firm principles that they wanted to stick to. Um, 
that you know they want it to create a permanent, clear, and unambiguous record of research and scholarly communications, which is what we want to do with the the organization identifier. Um, this, it needs to transcend disciplines, uh, geographic borders, and institutional boundaries. That's very important. Um, it has to be open to any organization that's um, interested. Uh, we can't really put up barriers because if we don't understand an organization or for some reason we don't, we don't feel they're good enough or anything like that. It really needs to be open to, to everyone. Um, and also there's going to be a lot of transparency in the organization and open source software. And uh, it will be uh, governed by a broad cross-section uh, cross of stakeholders. So these are really the, the, the core of the, govern the gov thoughts behind the governance of, the, of this new effort. Um, and there was a, um, since, since these slides are being distributed, I, you know, it's, it's always good to, to put some reading material in there for, the, for those of you who want to look more later. For technical requirements, um, I think the first part of coming up with technical requirements to solve a problem is really identifying this, the, the problem. Um, a lot of people think, oh, it, it, ORCID stuff, well, it works to solve the problem of identifying people. It wouldn't it be easier with organizations? <laughs> like I said, those were just slides, and I'm usually not that old, but there's a few left. <laughs> Um, so, but if you really look into organizations, they do all the things people do. Um, they merge, they split, they have aliases, they die, um, but they also, they can be reborn. They have sub-organizations. Um, people have children, but they're not, they, they're not going to share identifiers with organizations who really need to provide a different kind of link. And, and they're also affiliated organizations. So it gets pretty tricky. Um, if you look at it through rose cup colored glasses, you look at an institution and then you say, okay, that institution has a name, can't we just write down their name and put it in a spreadsheet somewhere and be done with it? That's very naive. So if you look at um, Harvard, you've got Harvard University. Uh, um, you've got, um, if someone's, uh, subs you know, for, from the subscriptions perspective, You've got the library name. Uh, from the technical perspective, you have IP addresses. Um, uh, from the membership perspective, again, it's Harvard University, so that's pretty simple. Some legal documents are going to have a completely different name. Um, and then, of course, there's the, 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 the divisions of the institution as a whole. So it can get pretty messy. So um, so as, as far as the um, technical inf infrastructure, I think the most important thing is that the problem has been defined. Um, um, now we're working on the, um, the governance. Um, this, the idea behind or the organization ID was officially launched on October 31st, 2016 on Halloween. Which I think there are lots of opportunities for marketing. <laughs> you know, because you can hide your identity on Halloween, but that didn't happen. But. <laughs> um, so it, when it was launched, there was a, 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 a few documents that were released that kind of uh, summarized the uh, the landscape and the technical considerations for building an organization. And they're actually pretty interesting. If, interesting if, if you're into this kind of stuff, and even if you're not, um, it's good to, to read up. They're, they're not dense documents, they're not very long, so you might want to just take a look at them. Um, and it was decided that the specific goal of this project is to, um, to, to create the structure, principles, and technology specifications for an open, independent, nonprofit, organizational identifier registry to facilitate the disambiguation of researcher affiliations, and that's it. You know, there's, we really want to avoid any kind of scope creep with this. I think this is enough to meet the needs of an identifier. Um, so there have been a series of, of working groups. 
um, after this project was announced, um, there was a, <laughs> there was a um, prolific ex expression uh, request for expressions of interest to be on, on a working group. And we did form a working group of a number of people from different parts of the community. And John Janaki from the California Digital Library was the chair. Um, and their main output were some governance recommendations, product recommendations, and a request for information to find out who was interested in actually being involved with this and hosting it and providing support for this um, organization. Um, so. Here's a list. This is a list of the governance recommendations. I'm not going to go through all of them, but um, they're, um, the main uh, point is to stress that they're, they're fairly detailed and well thought out, um, and they really stress the openness of the organization and the need for collaboration between communities, um, and that the software will be open source. Um, the product recommendations, uh, originally this, this effort has gone through a number of names. I think it was the Open PIIR originally, um, and I at this point, I don't even remember what the PIIR stands for. I could probably, if I thought about it, <laughs> could come up with it. But you know, that's, that's, it, that's not really descriptive enough. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll talk more about that later. But. Um, there are also some product information uh, recommendations um, that are kind of interesting. Um, basically, again, that all of this data that's output is going to be open. It's going to be, uh, and the focus is going to be serving the research community. Um, one of the things that really excited me about this, um, since I, I said uh, that for a while I was in charge of cross -track technology, but they specifically said that they're going to maintain a customer support ticketing system and an open knowledge base. I think a lot of times with these efforts, a lot of people have really good intentions and they, they don't understand until they release something just how many questions people are going to have, how many little tiny problems people have that need solving all the time, and how important it is to their organization that they need to they answer those questions and provide that kind of support. So I think that's a really important part of that. Um, so there was a um, 22 responses to the request for information from these organizations, um, and then there was a stakeholder meeting this January. So fairly well, not not recently at this point, but um, there was a, a stakeholder meeting to just kind of decide the next steps and see some presentations by organizations who were really concretely interested in serving as a host organization, and those. Uh, organizations were the British Library, ISNI, uh, California Digital Library, Crossref, OCFLC, and PSI. Um, the next step steps from that were the steering group and the working group met to kind of form some committees and councils. Um, ORCID, DataSite, and Crossref got together and discussed the proposals. So, but after that, um, we're almost ready to launch the next phase. We're within weeks. I wish I had more information, but I don't. Um, I think the plan is to release some more information in early September. I have some kind of quasi information I can share you that I know that um, for those of you who are interested in this sort of thing, the database will unofficially, but I think I can tell you this, will be seeded with data from GRID. Um, I think data site and Crossref will be very involved in the governance, so along with some other organizations. ORCID is not going to be as involved because they need to concentrate on other projects, but they're still very invested in this project. So what does this mean for Crossref? It means that we're going to have an open, community-governed, sustainable organization in the fire registry. That means we can have our members easily, once this is implemented, provide us with uh, affiliation data. Um, our plan is to um, help integrate this into the workflows that our members and or, uh, organizations um, use to provide us metadata. I know when we started accepting funder data, we created a widget that uh, manuscript systems and, pl and platforms could use to uh, request 
like to link funders up with the identifiers from the start when someone submitted a manuscript, and we'll be doing the same with the organization ID. Um, and at some point, we really hope to merge our open funder registry with the new registry so that you can just have one register, registry for organizations. And so what does this mean for hardware? Because it pretty much means the same thing. You'll be able to provide Crossref with um, organization IDs or provide, provide other sources, other um, users of your metadata with um, organization IDs. Um, your affiliation information will be a lot less messy. I think that's a good overall for everyone. Um, so if you're looking for more information, I have some links here. Um, the last link is just to a blog post saying we will have more exciting information in a few weeks. Um, so I'm sorry I don't have more to tell you right now, but um, if you stay tuned, um, you will uh, we'll be having a launch soon, and um, there will be a new name for the organization ID. It's not going to be called organization ID. I can't tell you what it's called, but I think a few slides ago, I had a cat. <laughs> So that's in the blue. <laughs> so I'll leave you with that. <laughs>
So we know how that will do. So probably uh, how you obtain it and also how you use it, which is going to Bridger's uh, point that some of this has to do with the use cases for the information, which may, of course, come up way downstream from when you collect it. Right. So there probably needs to be a, a broad base of you know, people who are involved in uh, manuscript systems, which collect the information, but also people who do analytics, decision support, uh, hosting, display, all of those would be use cases for the information. All right. Any, uh, Susan, can we get a mic down, oh, Susan? I, 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 I can repeat it. Oh, okay. Sorry, I will, first of all, thank you very much. I think this is something that absolutely I really do see great. Uh, Turn the mic on. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, thank you very much. I really see great utility for this, and I really absolutely support it. I, I thought it was interesting your observation about sort of uh, looking at one registry for. Um, all organizations for funders and institutions. Because I'm sure you figured this out because sometimes that building can be both a funder and a, an yeah. institution as well, which makes it a little bit more um, awkward. But I can certainly see a use case for institutions wanting to be able to uh, figure out who would their um, uh, you know, which of their faculty are publishing and what have you. So I really think it's real utility for this. So thanks for taking that on board. Yeah, I think, I think one of the uh, use cases I'm looking forward to would be all the institutions who want us, meaning publishers and, and their suppliers, to automatically populate their repositories with their, their faculty's research. Uh, that's, that's really difficult now. Uh, with Chorus, we have a, you know, a couple of experiments going on where it seems to be working, but it's, it really works because of data like Scopus. At this point, uh, I think this will make it more generally uh, available. So that's an exciting, well, I think it's an exciting use case. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much.